It is time to introduce some very special guests this evening. Drum roll, please. There we go. We've got Carrie Hutner, Amanda Jean Strode, and we may also have Anne Mayoral uh, joining us as well. So we'll go ahead and spotlight you guys, bring you up on screen here, and we'll get to know each other a little bit. Hey, Carrie, great to see you. Hey, Amanda Jean, hello. Excellent. So uh, it's so good to see both of you this evening. I am really just so glad that you're both able to join us and that all of these teachers here get to hear from you guys because when I think of excellent maker educators, you guys are top of mind. When I think of who would I want teachers to connect with and learn from, you guys, you guys are them. So maybe we can just kick it off with uh, a little round of introduction. So starting with you, Carrie, would you want to say uh, uh, who you are and what your job is and maybe how we know each other? Um, my name is Carrie Hutner, and my current job is uh, sixth through eighth grade informational technology. Um, and how we met was well, I teach in Verona, Wisconsin, and how we met was last year I started, I took a Pathfinders course, and I was lucky enough to select both yours and Matt's twice. <laughs> 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 and I quickly became a humongous fan because um, I have a, some of a maker background, but um, coding was not my thing. And it was the first time that I was actually had felt like I was successful and that um, I could actually do this and that this was fun. So, yeah, that's how we know each other. Uh, and that I... I really appreciated you being in our classes last year because you always like asked great questions and had great ideas to contribute and you're like well what do you think would this work and like oh I've never thought of it but yeah we should try it uh, and then um, we also got to meet up at the Infosys um, Crossroads conference in February in uh, in Arizona which it was great to meet you in person that day that was really cool same here. Actually, that was one of the most exciting parts of the crossroads was meeting you and Matt and being able to spend some time with both of you. So, yeah, it's it 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 is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's it's I I'm so excited for what we've learned together so far and what we're gonna do next. I've got we've got big plans with CodeJoy in Verona, Wisconsin. So we'll make them happen. <laughs> And uh, Amanda Jean, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, maybe tell us some of your many hats that you wear? <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a lot of hats, friends. <laughs> so my name is Amanda Jean Strode. I am currently a science teacher for grades two through five at a private Quaker school. I run after school programs. I've designed summer camps. Um, I've worked with lots of different organizations like the Microeducational Foundation and other nonprofits. And uh, I know Matt and Kelsey because I knew them when they first got hired at Bird Brain Technologies. So I was, you know, a teacher who was, you know, doing stuff with Bird Brain at the time. And um, I remember when you two got hired, <laughs> I was very excited, you know, and um, I think like Kelsey, I think you came out to see uh, a professional development, like a, a conference or something. I pr presented it at, at my school district. I think I was only a second year teacher or something. I was really, I was a lot younger. <laughs> yeah, your your reputation had preceded you. They were like, and when you go out to Downingtown, you're going to meet Amanda Jean and she's just so amazing. And she's done this, 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 and this. And like, they listed off this whole resume of stuff that you'd done. And so I was expecting someone in like their forties. And then I meet, you were like 24. And I was like, how? how has she done that much stuff already it's just because you jump in man and that is one of the things I really admire about you Amanda Jean is you just you jump in you have no tech fear and you just you jump in and you you I, I just I think that's amazing which is why you are now also our director of of learning here at Code Join, <laughs> and uh, also has been very very uh, responsible for planning these makeathons and and coordinating all of our people so thank you for that Amanda Jean <laughs> um, but beyond that, a, an amazing maker educator too. The things that you do with your students are just truly cool, truly, truly impressive. So, um, so let me ask you, uh, I'll, I'll start with Carrie here. What was your first teaching job and how did you get into maker education or computer science education, whichever one you want to start with, but what was your first teaching job? Where'd you start 
And how did you get into Maker and CS? So it, it, I, I've had a pretty crazy journey. Um, I started out as a Spanish teacher at the middle school level. Um, and I taught, my first job was in three different school districts and each of them had their own interpretation of Spanish language instruction. So I quickly realized that the middle school was a little bit rougher than I, I was prepared for at the time. Um, and I transitioned to bilingual education. So I taught um, for a good chunk of my career as a third grade teacher teaching in Spanish and English. Um, and what I found was that um, technology really leveled the playing field for a lot of my second language learners. And so I started really leveraging like technology, doing like um, uh, like recordings and stuff, because at the time the MP3 players were like the newest thing. And then they all of a sudden had a video component to them. So now I'm dating myself. But <laughs> uh, so I started using those and really realized how much I loved both bilingual education and technology ended up um, in Verona. Um, and there was an opportunity to go and become an educational technology coach. So I was working at two elementary schools and um, 3D printers had just started coming into the educational um, area. And I was at a conference and I was sitting next to a friend and um, there was a donors choose um, for 3D printers um, through MakerBot. And I was just like, why the heck would you want a 3D printer when we're having to deal so much with the stupid printers with paper? <laughs> I, you know, like we were trying to get people to move off of paper and use a little bit more technology. So it was like, I didn't know what a 3D printer was. <laughs> and um, so we somehow got the grant and um, I quickly learned how to take it apart and mm -hmm was very fascinated with like the components of stuff. So, you, you know, I'd always been a consumer of technology and then all of a sudden I started to be like a creator of it, you know, and, but be, be able to find, you, you know, like, and that was when I realized that I just really like making, I like um, the physical act of bringing something to life. Um, now I focus a lot on like design thinking with my students, but I went back into the classroom in 2020, um, mm -hmm. right as COVID started. Um, and um, yeah, I, part of it was that I was like, okay, you know, I can't tell, I, I love working side by side with other teachers to do, to, to bring technology to life in their classroom, but I want to try to practice what I preach. Mm. And so of course I picked the, probably the most difficult time to go back into education at the time. And, yeah. you know, and a lot of people were like, well, but you're teaching technology. Well, no, it was, it was Maker sort of, education no, I'm teaching really hard to do virtually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm at the middle school level again and, you know, and one of the reasons why I went back to the middle school level was that I wanted to really grow um, mm -hmm. beyond just like 3D printing and video game design and all of those. I, I really wanted to learn more. And I feel like at the middle school level, um, the students are always pushing you because they're always questioning, like, you know, why can't we do this and why can't we do that? So um, that's... Yeah, I, and you can see sort of behind me, like I, I, behind me, I have like my loom and I have the Glowforge from school right here and the 3D printers right over there, you know, so it's like I take it everywhere with me. So part of your part of your life now. It's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, two two things I wanted to pull out from from your biography there. One thing you said is is when you were teaching um, uh, bilingual. Uh, students uh, and when you were teaching bilingually you said that you found that technology was a really great like uh, uh, equalizer or was a really great like it leveled the playing field and that that seems so counterintuitive to a lot of teachers because they think oh if they haven't gotten English yet how am I going to explain technical things to them so what do you what do you mean by uh, technology helped to level the playing field with your students who spoke different languages 
Well, I used a lot of, um, because we talk about like the importance of background knowledge and how do you develop that background knowledge. And so I started with a lot of like videos. So I was, I was working our, our, no, I wasn't working. I was part of Discovery Educators Network. And so we were talking, you know, the power of video and I still find that the video is is super powerful because like I was talking with you a few weeks ago, um, I use yours and Matt's videos as an ed puzzle so that my students can stop and see it. And I actually had a student who her first language is Spanish and she's only been in our country for about a year and she's really bright, but a lot of times like class instruction was just too far out of her league wow. and so she would sit and watch your guys's videos on the hummingbird that was in the ed puzzle and then she'd stop and she was just like and all of a sudden when I stopped using the videos she was just like um but that's how I can access what's going on because I can return it and I can watch it again and it can slow it down and so I, I think a lot of times we we forget that that there, that's another access point for a lot of our second language learners. Yeah, that, that is a really powerful example of how um, just having the, the same information, but in a different format that students can stop, back up, listen to again, make it go slower, uh, have uh, captions or something on the bottom, you know, something like that. Those accessibility features are built into a lot of technology. And that that is just a really excellent point. And then one other point that I want to come back to, but perhaps a little bit later, actually right now, because it's so good, which is that um, you said that you wanted to go back to middle school to push yourself, which reminds me of something that Melissa Cook from Kent School District said earlier today. She had originally been with younger elementary school students, like second graders, and then she got moved to teach sixth grade and she was like, oh no, it's the big kids. I've got to learn hard stuff now. And so that's what got her into technology is that she was, um, she wanted to learn more to be able to kind of keep up with them. So are you finding that that's something similar for you that like going into middle school, you're finding that you want to push yourself with different technologies or different applications? Yeah, and I also, as you and Matt both know, I have the best of both worlds because I'm at the campus um, where our elementary school where I used to be at is. So my my students will learn something together and then we will go and work with the younger students and teach them. So like with the micro bit and stuff like that. So I, I, I think I came after the 3D printing, I, I sort of came to the realization as a teacher that I was never going to be ahead of my students. <laughs> I just needed to be able to learn with them. And, and um, I'm not afraid to make mistakes because if you're not, you're not learning. Um, but I, I think that that was the change in my career. In the past, I always thought I was like, you know, supposed to know everything. And now I, I realize, no, but I've got a lot of really good connections. Um, mm -hmm. So if I don't know something, you, you know, and that's what I'm trying to teach my students is, you, you know, yes, you're not going to know everything, but how do you find that information? How do, who are your connections? Who, who are your resources? Yeah. I, I find that with a lot of teachers too. There's a moment in many of our careers where either by choice or by push, we got pushed beyond what we know. And then suddenly we're like on stage in front of the kids and we have to admit, uh, I, I don't actually know what I'm doing any more than you do. So I guess if we're gonna do anything, I guess we just have to learn it together. And then it like opens this whole new way of teaching, right? I, that was my moment with computer science and robotics. I did not know what I was doing, right? And I just learned with the students that first year, but that can be a really like, it releases you from the responsibility of knowing everything as a teacher. Um, so uh, you were talking about your ed puzzles, by the way, Amanda Jean dropped this in the chat, but uh, here's an example of an ed puzzle and also an example of why you can't take screenshots of Kelsey's face. It always looks dumb. I'm too expressive. It never works, but <laughs> an ed puzzle. So it looks like we'd play this. I'm going to do right, so it. In this video. Shush. Um, 
so uh it plays through and then there's some kind of like points where it like stops and asks questions and things like that which just a, a really cool use of these pre-existing videos from the bird brain site that you took and then broke apart into learning videos for your kids using that tool called ed puzzle which is great well, and honestly, I, I knew I couldn't teach it better than you two at the time. So, I mean, you're, you, that's where you tap into your resources. Like if someone yeah. else is teaching it better than you feel you're comfortable with, mm -hmm. why not? Yeah, there's a real, there's a real like, um, like, like a, a, a I'm going to say humbleness or humility in great teachers, which is just like, I don't need to be the one that knows everything. And that's a good reminder for me that like, yeah, it's, it's, this is, that's what this makeathon has been all about. Like, it's been really great to bring other voices in who none of us are as smart as all of us, you know, so like use your resources. That's great. All right. So Amanda Jean, uh, uh, tell me a little bit about your first teaching job and how you got into maker education and technology and CS and stuff. Absolutely. So I, I call myself tech friendly. I don't like to say tech savvy because I don't know everything, but I'm very tech friendly. Like Kelsey said, I have like a, a zero fear complex when it comes to this stuff. But even when I was a kid, I really liked computers and I liked playing with those things. And we had a computer and I would very often be playing with it and break it and then have to figure out how to fix it because my parents could not do that. So I've always been, you know, into tech in that way but I never thought about it until my first year teaching. So I was very first year teacher and I had a say yes to everything policy being a young educator because I wanted all the opportunities, right? I wanted everyone to know my name. I wanted to, you know, be like teacher of the year. I wanted all these things. So I got invited to a random uh, professional development in my school district with bird brain technologies. They brought bird brain in to teach all the librarians. I was the only classroom teacher there. I taught fourth grade reading at the time. And I fell in love with this stuff. I just thought it was so cool. And I had no clue what I was doing uh, at all. And I, I kind of missed that, that moment in time. I was talking to another educator earlier today in a breakout room uh, who was new to computer science. And, you know, we were talking about how that moment where you don't know a lot. And I was saying I miss that moment so much because I feel like I did my very best teaching my first two years when I didn't know everything. And I had to say to kids, I don't know, go figure it out and then come teach me how to do it because I was forcing them into that kind of, you know, iterative iterative thinking and collaboration in the work we were doing. I was just providing the opportunity to do cool stuff. I was like, you make robots out of cardboard? Great. That sounds so fun. Um, and, you know, it, I had to integrate everything into my curriculum. So we found ways of integrating a curriculum. But that was really my foray into this whole computer science thing. And this whole making thing was it was a cool thing to do. I fell in love with it. I had no clue what I was doing. And then I had the kids really kind of teach me along the way. And it's turned into a bunch of wonderful opportunities since then. But yeah, I feel very, very akin to both of your experiences <laughs> in that. <laughs> Uh, two two things I want to pick up on that you said. You said you were the kind of kid that like you break the computer and then learn how to fix it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that was not me at all. I remember when my mom brought home that laptop that weighed like six tons, you know, and like I opened it up and I tried to do something and I got the blue screen of death. And my approach was to close the laptop and put it back underneath the couch. And when it, my mom opened it up and said, oh no, what happened? I was like, I don't know, <laughs> right? So growth mindset. We can be taught to learn technology. We can be taught to love technology. I feared it a little bit as a kid, right? But like, uh, I love hearing from people who had different approaches early on, which is great. Um, so, uh, and then another thing you uh, I picked up on in what you said, you said, I feel like I did my best teaching those first two years when I barely knew what was going on. But I think that really speaks to the need for us teachers to constantly be, um, 
revamping our curriculum, trying new things in our curriculum, if it ain't broke, don't fix it is not quite right. I think because like, actually, I think we need input, like teaching is an art form, right? And so if you just make the same picture over and over again, you stop being that like artist, right? And so instead you just become this like producer, right? And so uh, it's it's the difference between doing art that you love and like just kicking out a bunch of art. So I, I love that mentality, Amanda Jean. And, and I found that for myself learning Python this summer. I feel like I'm doing some great teaching this summer learning Python and I'm, I'm getting better at it, but I'm also not afraid to ask, hey, Mike, what's a method? And, you know, and ask these things and then, okay, I'm going to try to come up with an analogy for that. And I'll ask other teachers, how do you explain a function versus a variable and, you know, things like that. So I, I love that call out too to just continually kind of innovate uh, for ourselves as teachers. And I want to pause here for just a moment because, Anne, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm going to come spotlight you. Uh, let me see here. Hello. How's it going, Anne? Hello. It's really nice to be here. I'm so sorry I'm late. No, that's all right. You you told us that we were cutting it close, so we knew we were prepped. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. It's been a long time. Likewise, it's so nice to be back on the set. Yeah. <laughs> so, Anne, do you want to um, just briefly introduce yourself, who you are, what you're doing these days, and maybe how we met? Yeah, so my name is Ann Mayoral. I'm the program director for the uh, Berkeley, UC Berkeley Girls in Engineering program. It's an outreach program. We target um, underserved and underrepresented youth and try to get them interested in STEM. Um, our whole shtick is hands-on making and um, STEM activities. So um, I met Kojoy uh, through the pandemic. They were uh, basically our, our, our on-screen um, teaching support and Kelsey and Matt did an amazing job uh, taking and working with us uh, to turn our, our hands-on curriculum into really interactive and fun uh, Zoom experiences. Uh, we generally had like, well, I don't know, uh, like over a hundred people on each call, which was pretty phenomenal. Um, we, I think, we pushed the limits of Zoom um, and all that that it was <laughs> offering at that point in time. But uh, we had people coming from all across the U.S. and uh, making with us. So, yeah, it's it's been it's been fun. Yeah, man, that summer 2020, Code Joy had launched in March of 2020. We started working with you, I think, in April of 2020. And we started teaching that summer camp in June of 2020. And then we had like a couple hundred middle school girls and college age girls and, and friends and camp counselors all on one Zoom for three hours a day. Now you guys know why we do three hour classes, because we got used to it with <laughs> Anne in 2020. We were like, no more than three hours. This is all anyone can handle, but we can make three hours fun. Um, but yeah, uh, so so is Girls in Engineering um, back in, in person now and everything on, on the Berkeley campus? It is, yeah. We were back in person as of last year. We just finished our uh, summer camp, uh, what, two weeks ago. It all It's all a blur because I'm still kind of recovering from the chaos. Um, but we had another 120 campers join us plus let's see, 15 high school volunteers, plus, you know, a whole suite of researchers and faculty and staff come and help with camp. So it was, it was a great summer, but it always, it always takes so much out. Um, you know, as every, every educator knows, it's like giving, giving birth each time. <laughs> <laughs> it is every time you do that program again, even, even if you've done it before, it's because there's new kids and new staff and new challenges and that building's closed down and oh, the whole world is closed down. But man, your dedication that summer, you did not let that program, like everybody was like, well, I guess we can't do girls in engineering anymore this summer. And you were like, no, we're doing it. These girls deserve learning. And like, I will forever admire and respect the way that you like bulldoggedly fought to keep that program going that summer. And I mean, we did some amazing stuff. We invented things on Zoom that summer together. That was really cool. <laughs> we did. And I was so proud of, of 
what we came up with in such a short amount of time. We were one of the first um, programs to announce that we were going to move online, which in and of itself was a black, bo black box at the time. No one understood what that actually meant. And then I felt like what we delivered was phenomenal. Um, you know, with, with um, you and Matt and um, all of your skills and expertise that you offer, I felt like it really complemented what I could bring to the table. And, uh, you know, we still have uh, campers who, who remember that summer and who really appreciated uh, the experience that we gave them, but also the community element. And it was kind of a saving grace in a time when there wasn't a lot of people that you could interact with. And we gave them this kind of steady and a uh, fun thing to look forward to. And uh, it was a way to connect when we didn't have a lot of opportunities to connect. It was, I, I am, I will forever sing the praises of Girls in Engineering. It is such a <laughs> phenomenal program. And Matt and I talk all the time about how, how proud we are of the work that we got to do with you on that. Likewise, um, likewise. But, but I also wanted to ask you because, so you, you manage the girls in engineering or you, you're the director of the girls in engineering program now, but you've had a lot of other hats that you've worn before this. So would you give us just a, a brief sort of like, what's your background prior to this and how did you get into girls um, STEM programming? Yeah, so my background is actually in engineering. I was, um, I've, I was an aerospace engineer for the first half of my career and um, worked for the Department of Defense and you know similar agencies and realized that I wanted to um, do a different, have a different impact. There weren't a lot of women in engineering and uh, I saw that through undergrad and grad. And then when I got into my career, there were fewer women, especially in positions of power. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to change that dynamic and I wanted to um, change how we learned about engineering. Uh, I kind of experienced the traditional way of learning engineering and it was all based on book um, and, you know, reading and doing, you know, theorems and, and problems. And there wasn't a lot of hands-on elements. And mm -hmm. I felt like that really needed to change that we develop intuition by doing and by making mistakes, sometimes horrifically fantastic mistakes. <laughs> and um, and so I, when I kind of got into this place where I wasn't happy, where I was at um, because of all of these different factors, I really wanted to be um, a person for change. And so I went back to school for industrial design with a specific focus on toy and exhibit design and, and then made this huge shift to um, design. And so I got my design degree, you know, working for toy companies and freelancing for, you know, people like Mattel and Goldie Blocks and um, Tink, uh, Tinka Labs, which makes these little Lego compatible circuit cubes. Mm -hmm. And um, I helped design this indoor mini golf course in San Francisco and started making movie props and all of these things uh, did, and kind of on the side uh, because it didn't pay very well uh, doing after school programs and <laughs> um, and really loved introducing kids of all, all ages. So I had a a tinker um, class, which was age three to six. Mm -hmm. And then I had elementary schools um, that would hire me to come in and do days of making. And then I would have educators who would want me to come in and, and expand on their curriculum and uh, do some kind of making activity around a theme or a learning arc. And um, so I was kind of doing all of these things um, when I got offered the job at um, UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And and so I feel like my position now is, is kind of a natural extension of what I've been doing. And it allows me to kind of um, create the change that I wanted to see, which is, 
I really believe that um, we learn best when we're in this play space, when our brain isn't concerned about, um, you know, what the grade is going to be or how, what, you know, uh, like fundamental principle I need to get out of it, but it's just play. We're all here to play. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of where, where I ended up. <laughs> I create kind of playing playful environments for, for people to learn in. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And, uh, Matt just threw in the chat, the, uh, urban putt, which is the, the golf course that you helped design. And I'll bring that up on my screen here. Um, you've got, you have made so many different, really, really cool projects. This is just one that like is visually stunning. Really, really cool. So check that out, especially if you're ever in the San Francisco area, take a visit. <laughs> totally. well, so I, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so I, I wonder if I could kind of open, open this up. This is a, a sort of fun hands-on question because I know a couple of us are in our workspaces. So perhaps either finding the physical thing or grabbing a link What's one of your favorite maker tools that you think every classroom should have or that is just like one of your favorites? I'll go first because I see you guys all kind of looking around. So you can grab a link and throw it in the chat or look around your space. I'll show you one of mine. This is one of the things that Matt introduced me to. Um, okay, I need this. Can you find me a couple of brads, Matt, while I demonstrate this? Okay, so this is called a cropodile. I'm going to open it up here. This is a hole puncher for craft sticks. <laughs> Sorry, Amanda Jean. <laughs> Stole it. <laughs> so this is called a cropodile. I love this thing for maker projects because you can really punch a hole in anything, but I really like it with like a, a wide tongue depressors. So you can like punch a hole in like a tongue depressor like this, like so. I've punched a hole in there. And then if I had punched a hole in another craft stick, you can then just take a simple metal brad, put that through, and now you've got a linkage or a mechanism or something. And that is just such a, a great one to have in your, uh, in your arsenal. This is a crocodile. It's like 12 bucks or something on Amazon. You only need one for your classroom. Not everybody needs one. And yeah, Mike was using it this morning on an Altoids tin. He's got some project. Mike has one of those minds that like when he's got an idea, he's like a dog with a bone. He can't let it go. So he's doing something with an Altoids tin. I don't know what it is, but he's using a crocodile on it now. So they work on metal too, which is pretty cool. <laughs> but that's one of my favorite maker tools. Matt introduced me to that one. But uh, let's see, Carrie, did you have one that you wanted to share? Um, this is my favorite one. It's uh, with cardboard because I, I love cardboard. And so now I feel super powerful. So, you know, you can just go through cardboard like crazy. So this is one of my favorites. I, I, I make sure I know where it's at at all times. <laughs> is that one, how, how safe is that? For, is it a power tool? Yeah, well, it plugs in. Um, okay. And yeah, I, I mean, it has all of the guides and stuff. I don't give it out right away, but I do give it out, you, yeah. you know, because I, it, it, you'd have to be pretty clever to hurt yourself with it. Uh, um, but <laughs> teaching middle school, they're pretty clever. So. <laughs> uh, uh, Cecilia says in the chat, when you have those electric cutters with students, you end up with so many bits of cardboard everywhere because they love to use it. Did you have you found that too, Carrie? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like this is the, the go-to tool, you, you know? So yeah, we only have one of them. So maybe we'll get a second one someday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, I've heard that they are very effective. We have big, massive pieces of cardboard that you, we use for our sets here. So we'll cut massive things out of cardboard. And Matt, I think we should get one of those because I think I've developed carpal tunnel because of using like our like cruddy box cutters on cardboard. Uh, your, your pitch really sold me, Gary. Yeah, we're, we're investing. <laughs> hey, cardboard cutter guys, are you looking to sponsor any cool content creators? Because here we are, hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about you, Anne? Do you have a, a favorite maker tool that you want to share with educators? Okay, so you talked about the Cropodile. This is the Cropodile 2. Let's see if oh. I can... Oh. Um, 
Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so it, it actually allows you to, let me stop blurring. It allows you to cut even thicker things um, and it has two settings. So you can do uh, 3 sixteenths and is it one eighth? Yes, one eighth. So it's pretty amazing. And then it does eyelids. So, but since you already mentioned the crocodile, I have this other super cool tool. Uh, which is my little, um, let me see if I can get the glare off. It's my little um, handy dandy um, miniature set for, uh, you know, like screwing and unscrewing all sorts of stuff. Usually it's for my toy take aparts uh, when I want to disassemble something and re-engineer it. Uh, but I like it because it's kind of one of those grab and go tools. You just need one versus like a whole suite of screwdrivers. Yeah. Uh, because it has interchangeable, um, you know, bits on it. So I love that too, for like accessibility too, because you've got, you've got one and now you've got all those different little heads on it. So you don't need a whole set of anything. And like, you can conquer any little doodad <laughs> that you or your students might encounter. Precisely, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And so all of these tools that we're talking about, we'll grab links to them and we'll put them in the Padlet. And by the way, teachers, if you have some favorite maker tools that you like, feel free to share them in the chat or you can put them in the Padlet as well. We'll take a look at them. But if you have some favorite maker tools, go ahead and share those in the Padlet or in the chat and we'll transfer them to the Padlet. But how about you, Amanda Jean? Everybody keeps taking your ideas. What? <laughs> I mean, this is when you know you're in a room of like-minded people. When you say, what's your favorite thing? And everyone pulls out the same item. And you're like, gosh, darn it, that was my thing. <laughs> but I have I have kind of kind of two things that I would recommend. And that they're pseudo tools and pseudo strategies. So the first is cardboard attachments. Um, and I'll, I'll throw a link to like just random, they're, they're all over the internet, but having a cardboard attachments poster in my classroom is an essential. And at our school now, um, our, my, our teacher and myself, we kind of sort of co-teach a bunch. We both are in charge of the iLab at our school. Uh, that is like beginning of the year must-haves. Kids have to know how to use those because it saves so much in the long run. Like you're going to save duct tape, you're going to save hot glue, you're going to save material because they know how to put things together. Uh, yeah, there's a great example. Like being able to do an L brace or a tap, flanges, um, using a brass fastener. These are things that are really essential and you don't think it's like a big thing, but you take one class to go over that with kids and then your life has changed forever. It's so much better. And then another sort of thing that I, I do with kids a lot is uh, ready set design. Mm -hmm. So the Cooper Hewitt Museum has this ready set design uh, lesson, I guess they call it. There's a, there's a video and it is a really quick, simple lesson where they say you get three materials, a fastener, a surface, and a structure. And those could be anything. And then they have to solve a really sp specific problem. It can't just be like carry water. It has to be like, you know, you need to uh, go up and down, uh, without a flight of stairs or something really specific. They they line it up really well in um, in their content. And I do that with students all the time. I do it in after school clubs. I do it as a beginning to engineering. We do it um, to introduce kids to iLab. I mean, it's just such a great, quick and simple way to get kids into the engineering piece, into the making piece, but with something specific, a fastener, a surface, and a structure, right? Like yeah. those three things, and they could be anything that you want or that the kids want, but it has to be those three items. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really just sets them up for success. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love both of those, that, that cardboard attachment poster. I think I saw that in your room when I came to visit and I was like, that's great. Because like, especially we were working with bird brain, right? And bird brain does a lot of cardboard robots <laughs> and we've carried that over. And um, just like teaching kids to work with a me, it's a medium, right? They might know how to work with pencil and paper. They might not know how to work with clay and they might not know how to work with, right? So like, if you're going to work with paper, you should probably know how to fold things and what glues and adhesives work. How about with cardboard? Cardboard, you know, hot glue gun, 
box cutter. If you've got a hot glue gun and a box cutter, you can make anything work, I believe, in this world. <laughs> and a little bit of cardboard. And uh, but then with that cardboard attachment poster, yeah, like you said, like spend a day, a class period, having each kid make a different kind of cardboard attachment, put it on there, and then they see that and that's there so that when they go to make their project later on, they can just be like, oh, I should make a flange. Oh, I should do an insert, something like that. That's a really good one too. So as we're, we're uh, we've got about 10 more minutes of our uh, interview portion here. So if you guys have questions or comments or thoughts for these maker educators, be sure to pop those into the chat. Um, but my next question for you guys is, uh, uh, I know we've got tons of great tools and I, I definitely wanna share those on our Padlet, um, but really more about like practices. When you're setting up a maker classroom, are there certain practices that you do? Is there a lesson you always do at the beginning of the school year? Or is there a, a troubleshooting practice that you use or a question that you always ask? Like what's something that you kind of always do in your classroom that you think make, makes for a really nice maker, maker mindset learning environment? And anybody who wants to go first, just kind of wave your hand because this one's a bit of a thinker. So does anybody want to go first? Yeah, go for it, Amanda Jean. So I have a, a few firsts, depending on what that first thing is. So uh, when you're doing a lot of this maker stuff, a big ticket is that kids have to work together. And, you know, if it's your own classroom, um, that's one thing, right? You, if you're a homeroom teacher or something, but if you're in like a middle school where they're going to different class all the time, or if you're a special teacher, like I'm a specials teacher now, and they're not in my homeroom. I don't know what they're doing all the time, um, then you kind of have to set up collaborative working. And the lesson I, well, really it's a video I always use is the minions changing the light bulb. It's so ridiculous, but it works so perfect every <laughs> single time. And I, you know, like we're going to watch this video and they're going to accomplish a task. And I want you to watch and see, you know, what they did really well and what you might change and you get into all of the things involved in just that really simple video and they love it because it's minions and it's funny right so they talk about safety and you know um being a leader and being part of the team and collaboration all of that just in that quick video so that's a go-to beginning of whatever yeah there they are they're like trying to change the light bulb the one guy's boss and the other guy around he calls everybody to help him then they do it but they don't do it really safe and they break light bulb it's like a whole thing so really cute and fun um if i'm doing like intro to micro bit i always do what is a robot and just asking kids that question is always hilarious and fun um, they have no idea what it is and they have all these grand ideas and then it's always so simple. It's sense, think, act, right? Just like we do a code joy. Uh, Kelsey's got right there, sense, think, act, that's <laughs> what robots do. And um, the first thing I always do with Microbit is I have them download rock, paper, scissors. It's a go-to every single time. It's a crowd pleaser. It gets them through the downloading, which is like the hardest part. Uh, especially at our school, we cannot pair our micro bits because it's blocked. So we have to do a manual download. It's a whole thing. So they get to that download, they get that rock, paper, scissors, and the room erupts <laughs> to rock, paper, scissoring. And then we like, I line them all up and they do a tournament with the rock, paper, scissors and their micro bits. It just little simple, fun things like that. Those are my like, some of my beginning go to some of my early early stuff on both of those like the the second one you, you were talking about that really speaks to what Anne was talking about earlier like get out get out of the theory and get to the play as fast as possible so you're like okay let's just let's get to the download but I want to motivate you with something you'll enjoy which is a game and then we'll play that game and then that makes all the theory that we're going to learn worth it because you see what that does in practice. So, uh, man, I love teachers with with our with this mindset that we all share here. Uh, how about you, Ann or Carrie? Whoever wants to jump in next, what's a, an activity that you always do or a practice that you do in your maker classrooms? Go for it, Ann. Go. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously, my my um, classroom is a little bit different, um, and so. There's there's a couple things that come to mind. <clears throat> the first thing that comes to mind is uh, we get campers for a week. 
Um, and it's not a lot of time to kind of um, get over some of the like social hurdles, right? And so the first thing that we do um, when after, you know, we kind of uh, rally up is we do um, an icebreaker that forces them to meet each other and to kind of escape their shell in a very low, uh, low floor, high ceiling kind of way. So we do uh, human bingo where uh, they have to go around the room, find people who you know meet one of the criteria on their card and, um, and just get comfortable kind of introducing themselves to strangers, right? Getting them talking, getting them um, on a one-on-one -on -one versus even a small group kind of setting. We try to just get them talking and it's an opportunity for for my staff and myself to kind of see um, who is um, not as engaged and then we can introduce ourselves to them and help them out and um, kind of see who's going to need a little bit of extra support. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing that comes to mind is um, is kind of a twofold <laughs> response. The, um, Everything that we do in engineering uh, is is research that's done on on UC Berkeley campus, right? So there's it's very cerebral. In some ways, it's it's very um, out there. And so for every activity, I start with something that that they can relate to very easily, um, so that they have um, a foundation to build upon. And then the other part of the activity is showing relevance. So something relatable and something relevant. And um, so one that they can let, um, build upon, but also see why this is important, not just to the world, but to them personally. Mm -hmm. So on every activity, I try to make sure that those are front and center and, and um, something that they can, they can say, oh, I know how to, I know how to do that whether it's paper tape um, for circuits um, or learning how to test conductivity with glass and, and um, you know, uh, metals so that they can learn about semiconductors. Everything that I do starts with those two things. Yeah, I, and I love that, that, you know, the, I think the, the newer fangled term for that would be like, culturally responsive teaching. You want to make sure that it's relevant to the students and that it, it connects to something that they know that's important to them, but it's just good teaching, right? Like you got to know your students and I love the icebreaker activity so you can get to know some of what they do or don't engage in, right? And then like, okay, we're going to make sure that this lesson isn't, again, just, it's not just theory. It's not just up here. It's, it's here. It's, oh, I know how to do that. My hands have already done something like what we're going to do today. I love that. Uh, how about you, Carrie? What what practices or um, things do you in implement in your classroom to make for a nice maker atmosphere? Well, one of the practices that I use a lot, and I use it in my teaching, and I also teach it, is the the launch cycle with um, that John um, John Spencer created. So the first step is like look, listen, and learn. So it's always like okay, you, you know, so we're going to do a games unit um, in seventh grade starting this school year. And part of it is, is they're going to walk into the classroom and there's going to be games all around the room. So, you, you know, it, which it gives you an opportunity to see how they interact without you being the, the part. Um, and I, that helps me to look, listen, and learn about them and start to ask them questions. But it also is sort of what the design thinking process is. Um, so I use that a lot, like in how I approach what I'm going to teach, but then what I do with the kids also. So um, that would be one of my, my super go-tos. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Uh, just to add on that, one of the process, one of the uh, things that we do in Code Joy, and this is a really small thing, but we're all virtual all the time. Sometimes people are in the same room, sometimes they're in a different room, and we know that like learning is a vulnerable thing, especially for grownups, especially for grownups who are learning with other grownups who are in their field who might like know a little bit more than them, and it's like it's actually kind of a stressful process to make a mistake 
in front of your adult peers, right? And so a way that this is a little thing that we do that's mostly silly, but actually serves a purpose, which is that whenever somebody says, oh, I haven't gotten mine to download or, oh, this hasn't worked, we work through it together. And then when they get it, we have everybody unmute at the same time and they go, woohoo. I'm sure you all have experienced that because you've been doing PD with us this summer. And it's a little thing, but I'm sure some of you could attest that like when you get to do it for somebody else, like you genuinely feel like Carrie, you got it. Woohoo. And when it's me, I'm like, Kelsey, I got it. Woo and then everyone woohoos for me. And it's a little thing where like just for a moment, 34 people all across the country, I did it, are all celebrating that I did it. It's a little thing. And everybody reacts differently to it, right? But like mostly when we get that, we get a lot of smiles. And it is a way that encourages bring your problems to the forefront. We all learn from watching you fix it, right? And we have them share their screen. They do the fixing of the code or whatever it is. We don't do it for them, right? And so we, we're very public about that. And we're also very public about like, whatever mistakes you just made, a kid is going to make them. So by us learning how to correct, us seeing how you're troubles how we're troubleshooting that mistake, now we're all going to get better at troubleshooting with our students too. Um, well, I, I could talk to you guys for like six more hours, I swear. Let's get pizza. Let's just give them, better yet, let's get margaritas. It's Friday night, you know? <laughs> yeah, I love that, and It reminds us to celebrate the small victories, that every time we mess something up and fix it, that is a victory. We are doing that maker mindset of education. Um, well, thank you guys so much for joining us for this interview portion, but Carrie and Amanda Jean, thank you guys so much. What a, what a rich conversation with all three of you.